everybody. Welcome to the public presentation of research from the 2014 Outer Banks Field Site. I'm Andy Keeler, director of the site. Uh, the Outer Banks Field Site, for those of you who don't know, is a rigorous residential program for upper level UNC undergraduates and hopefully in the future undergraduates of other UNC institutions. In addition, there's a full academic schedule, internships, a variety of cultural and experiential activities, and of course, the focus of what you're gonna see today, which is the group research project. Um, on behalf of the faculty and students of the field side, I'd like to start by thanking some of the people that made this year's program such a success. Uh, in particular, our community advisory board has been just great in terms of passing on their knowledge of Eastern North Carolina and the Outer Banks region, and in making the students feel at home, led by our wonderful chairperson, Beth Story. And I'd also particularly like to recognize Robert Perry, the former director of the site for so many years, who's been so helpful to everybody. The field site has been, I mean, the, the board has been just great. And, helping the students not only feel at home, but understand the context of Eastern North Carolina for their research. Um, this project would simply not have been possible without the cooperation and collaboration of Joey Daniels of the Wanchi Seafood Company and his staff. I, I can't imagine a better research partner than Joey's been. He's given full access to faculty and students, answered thousands of our, in the case of faculty, really stupid questions, been amazingly patient, um, never sought to influence the research in any way other than seek what was, what was contributing to knowledge. Um, so again, from all of us, thank you so much, Joey, for everything you've done for us this year. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the internship member, mentors. Uh, part of this field site is an intensive internship program that's 16 hours a week. Uh, all of you who helped the students and taught them so much, thank you very much. I'd like to now recognize our outstanding Outer Banks field site faculty, Corey Adams, Lindsay Dubbs, uh, Lee Lighty, and Adam Gibson, who did so much for the students and have done uh, such an exceptional job. Uh, it's our, our great loss that Adam Gibson is leaving us for an exciting opportunity at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Adam has done a, a, such a great job of bringing rigor to the social science data collection and analysis part of this field site. It's something that we hope very much and will work hard to continue. It's going to be hard to do without you, so thank you so much for everything you've done. Good luck, and we certainly hope you come back and visit us frequently, even in the winter when it's too cold to surf. Um, uh, we'd also like to thank Brian Ness and Amanda Kitchla of the Institute of Environment at UNC Chapel Hill for being here today. The Institute of Environment is the Coastal Studies Institute partner in this enterprise, and we're very grateful for their collaboration and support. Um, a couple things about the research. Uh, we've asked the students to take on a very complex topic in a very short amount of time. Um, there's no, we told them there's no right or wrong answers, and their task was to use the tools of rigorous academic research and analysis and interpretation to learn something new and then be able to pass it on to you guys. Um, so. Part of what you're going to see is not just what they've learned, but how they've learned it. You're going to be seeing methodology and statistics in addition to just results. So be, beware and be warned. Uh, and secondly, they've done a lot in a short amount of time. If they had a couple more months, they would be able to do even better. Um, but uh, anything that's still unresolved that you guys have expertise on, they would be delighted to hear from you and hear your opinions about this specifically and natural resource management on the Outer Banks generally. So please stay and talk to them afterwards. There's a written report that goes along with this. It's available with a few written copies back there as well as uh, PDF copies on flash drives. You'll also be able to download it just by Googling OBXFS. And finally, a couple things. Please turn your cell phones to vibrate or off during the presentation. And if you don't mind, please hold your questions to the end of the presentation to let the students get through. And now I'd like to introduce our site's outstanding associate director, Lindsay Dubbs. Thank you, Andy, and thank you everyone for coming to this year's um, capstone presentation. I have the pleasure of introducing the few but mighty uh, Outer Banks Field Site 2014 class. So I'm gonna just go ahead and jump right into that. Um, first, Jerome Allen is a junior from Greenville, North Carolina. He's majoring in environmental studies and dramatic arts. Quinton Grady is a senior from Goldsboro, North Carolina. He is majoring in environmental studies. Dakota Konigsberg is a senior from, from Arden, North Carolina, and he's double majoring in economics and environmental studies. Charlotte McEwen is a senior from Durham, North Carolina, 
She is also a double major, but she's a double major in public policy and environmental studies. Michaela Meredith is a junior from Elon, North Carolina. She's majoring in environmental studies. And finally, um, John St. Clair is a relatively local student. He's from Camden, North Carolina, and he's a senior studying environmental studies. So John is actually going to start us off today uh, introducing the project. So I'll just hand it right over to you, John. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, hi, we're the Outer Banks Field Site of 2014. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate seeing you mm -hmm. here. Uh, our project today, is, or our presentation, is titled The Oyster Banks, A Dive into the Political, Scientific, and Social Realms of Oysters and Oyster Aquaculture in North Carolina. We'd like to uh, give thanks to people that have helped us along the way, our community board of advisors, uh, internship mentors, and people that have spoken with us uh, throughout various field trips we've taken uh, during the semester. We'd also like to, like to give special thanks to Joey Daniels, Bill and Ellen Keeley, Allison Lewis, Stephanie O'Daly, Corey Adams, and the Northeast North Carolina Coastal Research Environmental Education Fund. To get started, Oyster trend, or oysters in North Carolina, the population has uh, been decimated over the past 100 years due to uh, various reasons, uh, one being over harvesting, others uh, such as disease and habitat loss. Uh, this has not only resulted in a loss of the oysters themselves, but also a loss in ecosystem services that are associated with oyster reefs. And ecosystem services are simply the benefits that people receive from ecosystems. Uh, they're the reason we care about oysters. The obvious ecosystem service that oysters provide is uh, food, a source of food and a source of income. But they also provide other ecologically important benefits as well, such as nutrient regulation, water filtration, and habitat provision for many species of fish. The oyster we studied this semester was the eastern oyster. It's a bivalve mollusk that can live for up to 40 years, can grow to eight inches in length, and typically lives in water with salinity concentrations of 12 parts per thousand uh, and temperatures between 34 degrees Fahrenheit and 97 degrees Fahrenheit. The ecosystem services provided by these oysters in particular are nutrient regulation, water filtration, habitat provision, and shoreline protection. However, the ecosystem services that we studied most in our research was nutrient regulation, water filtration, and habitat provision. So this is a diagram of the ecosystem services provided by a wild oyster reef. As you can see, you have all types of creatures living inside the reef itself, but you also have the reef filtering the water um, surrounding the reef. This takes particles, suspended particles, out of the water and deposits them uh, on the bottom of the sound. Uh, providing nutrients for the growth of submerged aquatic vegetation. The addition, um, or the improved water clarity also allows more sunlight to penetrate the water column and provide sunlight for photosynthesis for these uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. And submerged aquatic vegetation are just marine plants that provide habitat to many valuable commercial fish species. In North Carolina, it's considered critical fish habitat. Uh, policy in policy regulations, uh, aquaculture is seen as a threat to SAV, and this has limited the number of permits that have been uh, approved for aquaculture operations. So aquaculture is just a term used for the farming of marine organisms in their natural habitats. Uh, it has a potential to decrease, uh, to decrease the pressures that are currently on wild oyster reef populations. Uh, improving, or improving the amount of aquaculture in North Carolina would not only reduce pressures on wild reefs by adding more oysters into the water that could be uh, taken out instead of these wild oysters, um, but it also reduces pressure on them um, or allows them to produce more ecosystem services. And our research wanted to find out if the aquaculture facilities had ecosystem services of their own. And we also wanted to research any effects on SAV that aquaculture facilities might have. 
So there were three strands of our research. We had a natural science component which studied potential ecosystem services that aquaculture facilities might have to offer. We studied a social science component which helped us understand public attitudes towards oysters and oyster aquaculture in the state uh, and a policy consideration which allowed us to consider how policies regarding oysters and oyster aquaculture in North Carolina have affected the industry and potentially limited its growth. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to Charlotte McEwen, who will give a little bit more information on the natural science portion of our capstone research. Here you are. Thank you, John. To begin, we'll be looking at the natural science research that we conducted. The four main components of this research was looking at the habitat provided by the aquaculture facility and the effect that the aquaculture facility has on water quality, nutrient regulation, and SIV abundance and distribution. Now to give you a better understanding of where our study took place, here's a satellite image of our study site. It's approximately where the Roanoke Sound and the Pamlico Sounds meet, and this arrow indicates indicates the aquaculture site that we studied. Just to the south and to the north are our two control sites. The control site to the south was adjacent to a natural island, and the control site to the north was adjacent to a dredge spoil island. And because the aquaculture site is also adjacent to a dredge spoil island, the control site to the north had more similar conditions, and thus most of our research took place at that control site. The Wanchis Harbor is located 2.14 miles away from where we studied, and the Oregon Inlet is located 3.56 miles. With the close proximity to Oregon Inlet, there is a high degree of flushing and a high salinity concentration at our study sites. This map is the map that we used while at the facility to orient ourselves. It's oriented from north to south, and the dark gray are boating canals used for navigation, and the white is where oysters are actually deployed. The black dots indicate poles that are in the water to section off different areas and quadrants of the facility. And the dark gray rectangle labeled shed is basically the headquarters of the aquaculture facility and is where all equipment and gear is kept. Now, Joey uses two methods of growing his oysters. The first being floating bags, as you can see here. And the bags are oriented in lines, and they're floating on the water with the oysters inside. And the second method is using submerged racks, which you can see here. Well, <laughs> that, that was planned, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so these racks are comprised of three cages stacked on top of each other, and they are underwater. And in the picture, you can see what the cages actually look like when there are oysters inside. We now have a short video to show you, to give you a better idea of what the facility looks like. So as you can see in the video, these lines are the submerged bags, which you can see on the floor over there. <laughs> Um, and to the right, th you can see the Dredge Spoil Island, which is located 0 0.04 miles away from the facility. And the site is ran by Joey and his team of three employees. He submitted his leasing permit in July of 2011 and first began harvesting oysters in 2013. At the time of our study, there were 124 oyster bags and racks deployed in the aquaculture facility over an area of just under 12 acres. The floating bags are primarily on the west side of the facility, and the bottom racks are primarily on the east side. Our study took place in September and October of 2014. And in this part of the video, you can see the um, floating bags on the left side and the submerged racks are on the right side of the screen, but they are submerged, so you can't really see them. And I will now pass it over to Quentin to talk about habitat provision. Thank you, Charlotte. 
So the first portion of our natural science attempted to gauge the value of habitat provided for organisms by aquaculture gear, or in short, habitat provision. We started with two research questions, which we then rephrased into hypotheses. The first hypothesis states that oyster aquaculture facilities provide habitat for species that would typically be found near wild oyster reefs, but would not otherwise be associated with areas of sandy bottom or SAV. And this hypothesis was really built in order to find some overall trends in our data and also was built around research that we conducted of what to expect from different organisms, species around wild oyster reefs. Our second hypothesis states the more time elapsed since the initial deployment of an oyster rack, the more organisms that an oyster rack will provide habitat for. So this hypothesis tests a temporal relationship we expected to find within the facility, and this will be shown through data analysis and some statistics. So to kind of describe the methods, the overall methods of our research, we started with out in, on, on Joey's facility, we took these racks that you see that Charlotte described. He took them up out of the water with a crane with a tarp below them. We loaded them on to this boat, as you can see in the picture as well. And once we opened it, we saw a bunch of oysters inside. We started getting our hands, getting on our hands and knees with little scoopers and digging out fish and crabs from inside of these racks. We found a very large amount of some smaller crabs, so like there are 200 small mud crabs in one of the rack pools that we had. Once we got all the crabs and fish out, we would put them in aerated buckets to the side. And aside from counting these organisms, invertebrates and fin fish, we also consider the algae that grows on top of the racks. So we used a small, about corner size, few squares on each corner of the top during each of our rack pools to measure the algae present, which could also provide a food source for some fin fish and invertebrates, as well as a component of the habitat of the oyster, aqu oyster aquaculture. And these scrape samples ended up being used to find total weights and also carbon hydrogen and nitrogen concentrations within the algae. The total, we found total of eight species of fin fish within our rack pools and six species of invertebrates, 84 individual fin fish, and 387 individual invertebrates. We reviewed species of fin fish and invertebrates which typically utilize natural oyster reefs as habitat. And we assessed our first hypothesis utilizing these trends of organisms found and comparing what we found in our research to what we would expect of animals that utilize oyster reefs. So to go through these, we found five species of fish and two species of crabs at our study site which either utilize oyster reefs as habitat or prey upon oysters, including oyster toadfish, blenny, skillet fish, taw tog, sheep's head, blue crabs, and mud crabs. I'll kind of outline here what these creatures look like. This first guy right here, little oblong shaped fish, it's called the oyster toad fish. They don't have much of a recreational or commercial value, but they are very important within wild oyster reef habitats. We found them within our research. The feather blenny, along with one other type of blenny, were found at the site. We found a large abundance of mud crabs, and we also utilized a one centimeter as our cutoff for measuring these organisms. So we would often find lots of smaller critters such as mud crabs, blue crabs, even organisms such as tunicates that would be found within the racks. And lastly, this is a skillet fish, which are actually quite rare to find, and they are known to utilize natural oyster reefs as habitat. So we are very pleased to see them within the oyster aquaculture cages. And then this is a taw tog, which represents a very high recreational value. It's a popular sports fish. The sheep's head, which are found in abundance, hold recreational value. And then the blue crab, which has been said by many to be one of the, the most important commercial crab within North America. And we definitely expect to find those here. So aside from just what we found, from the organisms present within the racks. Our research supported some trends that we found within other research, previous research. <laughs> we found that juvenile fish utilized oyster aquaculture gear habitat especially, which is very important aside from just the habitat value presented to overall organisms. As well, the taw tog, which we found present, has been shown in previous studies to prefer submerged aquaculture gear. So this is also supportive of our hypothesis. And lastly, 
Joey, when he laid out his aquaculture facility, he utilizes the headquarters that Charlotte showed you in the study site flyover. There's a, a large board within the headquarters that has a huge amount of dates, numbers of every single rack pool and deployment that he's used. And our second hypothesis, which compared the total number of organisms with the time of deployment, this was tested through a linear regression and an exponential regression. As you can see, the exponential regression showed a little bit tighter of a correlation. This data practically shows us that with further study, we would expect to see this temporal relationship between deploying oyster racks, having initial oysters inside of these racks, which provide food source for different species of finfish and selfish, and then finally support further relationships between the organisms present. And now Michaela Meredith can tell you some more about natural science. Thank you, Quentin. The next two ecosystem services that we looked at were water clarity and nutrient regulation. These are important in understanding how SAV abundance and distribution might be affected at an aquaculture facility. As you can see, water filtration and nutrient cycling provided by oysters highly affects SAV growth. This picture on the left is actually from one of our first capstone meetings here at CSI. It was very ha hastily drawn on the board, but we were trying to decide what ecosystem services we wanted to look at. This really shows how you can see the oysters on the right are filtering particulate matter out of the water column and they're redepositing it into the sediment surface through their feces. In the sediment surface, these particulates are remineralized, which means they're changed into a form that SAV and algae can use for growth. Furthermore, as these particulates are being filtered out of the water column, it leads to better water clarity and more sunlight can penetrate the water and reach SAV. Um, each of these ecosystem services use different methods. However, there are three treatments across the board that we used. Inside refers to the inside of the aquaculture facility. You can see in the map, it's what's highlighted in blue. Outside refers to the outside or the perimeter of the aquaculture facility. And the control site was simply the same across both sites. Regarding water clarity, our primary question was how does oyster aquaculture affect water clarity using light as a proxy as compared to a control site with no oysters? We hypothesized that water clarity would be in fact improved at the aquaculture oyster facility. We used a LICOR sensor, which can be seen on the picture on the right, to measure photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR. This is simply the light levels that SAV can use for photosynthesis. These light levels were measured at both the surface and the top of the SAV at multiple sites along the perimeter and the inside of the aquaculture facility. We then converted the PAR levels into light extinction coefficients using the lambert beer equation, or K sub D. And the K sub D, or light extinction coefficient, is simply how much water is penetrating the water column and changing with depth. Results showed that overall there was a higher light extinction coefficient at the control site, which means that water clarity was improved or tended to be clear at the aquaculture facility. And just to give you a better idea of what a high light extinction coefficient means versus a low light extinction coefficient, it's a little bit backwards of what you would typically assume. A higher one means that there's less light reaching the SAV. There's more particulate matter in the water that's blocking how much sunlight reaches the SAV. And when you have a lower light extinction coefficient, that means there's greater light penetrating the surface and reaching the SAV. And the one on the right with the lower light extinction coefficient is what we found at the aquaculture facility, which is good. The second we looked at was nutrient regulation, and we asked how does oyster aquaculture affect nutrient concentrations in the sediment and water column. Sediment water is also referred to as poor water throughout our presentation. We hypothesized that oyster aquaculture affects nutrient concentrations by converting these nutrients in the water column back to the sediment. We used poor samples, um, poor water samples and water column samples using a core, which basically for the sediment you just stick in and stick a cap over it and you can see in the top right picture you have a sediment sample. And then water column samples were just taken simply in the water. We took these samples back to the lab and looked at phosphate and ammonium concentrations. We picked these two nutrients because they're essential to SAV and algae growth, and algae is what oysters eat. These results showed that overall there was a statistically significant difference between the nutrient concentrations in the water column and in the pore water. However, overall we found higher concentrations of ammonium and phosphate at the aquaculture facility. These two concentration levels were within the range of quality estuary health, therefore, um, which, which is good. <laughs> Um, next, looking at SAV abundance and distribution, our question was, is the density of SAV in the study site representative of the density outside the study site? 
We hypothesized the SAV density would be greater immediately outside and inside the aquaculture facility than at the control site. And this, of course, was with the exception of the SAV that was under the racks, or their submerged aquatic gear that was at the facility. We used two methods for this uh, study. The first was a simple presence-absence presence method. We simply were in the water. We bent down using our right and left hands along different transects that had been measured off at the facility, and we simply noted if there was a presence of SAB or if there was an absence on each side. The second method also utilized transects. However, this time we used something called a quadrat, and this is one foot by one foot, and it's simply dropped into the water vertically. And what you do is you pull all the SAV out that's within that quadrat. We took it back to the lab, sorted it by species, and measured for shoot density. Results showed that there was, in fact, a greater concentration of SAV outside the aquaculture facility than there was inside. However, overall density was greater at the control site. But because there was no statistically different in the densities between the control and aquaculture site, it does not seem that the gear is actually affecting the SAV. And overall, just to summarize those results again and pull them together, water clarity was in fact improved at the facility over the control site. Nutrients were higher concentrations within good levels ranges at the facility over the control site. And while SAV was greater in the density at the control site, the density found wasn't significantly different from the densities at the aquaculture facility, which is a good sign showing that these gear might not be affecting the SAV as thought. And now I'm going to pass it over to Dakota for social science research. Thanks, Michaela. Given that people drive the demand for oysters and that the public's attitudes will affect the regulatory framework as it pertains to oysters and oyster aquaculture, we found it valuable to gauge the public's perceptions, knowledge, and opinions about oysters. We began with a qualitative survey with two industry professionals and used the results of this survey to inform the development of a quantitative survey. We deployed this survey at three different locations, downtown Manio and in two different restaurants, one being in Nags Head and the other in Kill Devil Hills. We then took the completed surveys and compiled the results. We made statistical summaries, which include the percent of responses for each answer choice for every question. And uh, we also included means and standard deviations where relevant. We then ran independent sample t-tests, which test for statistical differences between two variables, and we ran analyses of variance, or ANOVAs, which test for statistical differences between three or more variables. We also included an economic component to our social science survey, and this manifested in a contingent valuation question, which will be discussed shortly. Two of the questions in our survey were regarding oyster preference and willingness to pay for that preference. As you can see in the chart, 50% of respondents said that they preferred wild harvested oysters over farm raised oysters. However, if you limit this to only those who expressed a preference, 98 to 99% of respondents preferred wild harvested oysters. Also, about 60% of respondents said that they were willing to pay more for their preference of oyster. We also asked respondents to define what they consider as locally produced food. While there were a variety of answers, the most common were 50 miles, denoted by the yellow circle, and 100 miles, denoted by the red circle. Respondents also expressed that it was important to them, for the most part, that their food was produced locally. So we use these t-test and ANOVA results to analyze two variables in particular. The first was knowledge. For both types of oysters, both farm-raised and wild-harvested, people who had eaten them tended to know significantly more about them. However, the number of times people had eaten them did not have an additive effect on their knowledge of them. So what this suggests is that simply having tried them once was enough for people to know more about them. Also, those who said that they were willing to pay more for environmentally friendly produced food tended to know more about oysters. The willingness to pay variable was assessed a little bit differently. There was an informational paragraph in the survey which explained the benefits of oysters and of farm-raised oysters in particular. After given this information, respondents were asked whether they were willing to increase their willingness to pay 
as a result of the information. Those who were persuaded to increase their willingness to pay tended to believe more strongly that society values and appreciates oysters. Also, those who were persuaded to increase their willingness to pay tended to believe that oysters are useful for more than just food. Assuming that we want to increase people's preference of and consumption of wild harvested oysters, I'm sorry, farm-raised oysters as compared to wild harvested oysters, there are three strategies that our results suggest. The first is that we can increase people's knowledge of the origin of farm-raised oysters. As you can see in the chart, um, our study site was well within the 50-mile distance that people consider local. So we can appeal to people's preference for local food. Second, we can increase people's knowledge of environmental benefits of farm-raised oysters. Throughout the survey, people expressed that uh, they had environmental values, especially through their willingness to pay more for environmentally friendly produced food. So we can appeal to these environmental values as well. And third, we can simply get more people to try farm-raised oysters. In one of our t-tests, we found that there was a significant difference in the knowledge between people who had tried oysters and people who hadn't. And while we don't know whether people who already have knowledge of oysters tend to seek them out, or whether the, the actual experience of trying oysters increases people's knowledge of them, we think that both are, pro are likely present. Then there was the economic component to our survey, which manifested in this contingent valuation question. Now, contingent valuation is a stated preference method that's useful for establishing values for non-market goods, for example, an ecosystem service. The ecosystem service addressed in our contingent valuation question was that of habitat provision. The way contingent valuation questions work is that a policy is proposed and respondents are asked whether they would vote for or against the policy. The policy in question is the establishment of an oyster seedling nursery within the state, which would stimulate the oyster aquaculture industry, which would in turn provide more habitat for non-oyster fish species, and the end result would be a 10 to 15 percent increase in the amount of fish produced. All CV questions also have a payment vehicle, which is how the policy in question is to be paid for. For in-state residents, the policy was to be paid for by a one-time increase in their income tax. And we chose five distinct values where each survey had one of these values, and you can see the values here. After getting the results of this question, and with the help of Allison Lewis from ECU, we were able to uh, analyze our results, which are presented in this table. So there were 103 total respondents that were North Carolina residents. And we can take two primary things from this table. The first is that if our results are valid, over 50% of people are willing to pay at least $96 to realize this 10 to 15% increase in fish production. The second thing we can take away is that our range of values was not quite wide enough, particularly on the upper end. What we would have liked to see is, what we would have liked to have chosen a value high enough to where we could have observed a significant decline and the demand for oysters. However, as you can see, at every value, more than 50% of respondents were willing to pay that price. And now, Jerome Allen will talk about policy considerations. Thank you, Dakota. So we took a look at the scientific and the social perspective around oyster aquacultures, we also widened the scope to include the public policy surrounding oyster aquaculture. Our purpose for doing so was to understand the regulatory framework and policies impacting oyster aquaculture. Our methods for doing so was looking into North Carolina and federal legislation as well as other coastal states. And just to frame our research, we asked the question, why has oyster aquaculture in North Carolina remained relatively stagnant? So to begin to understand the answer to this question, we must establish the flow of power. For the state, 
players. There are the Division of Marine Fisheries, the Marine Fisheries Commission, the North Carolina, sorry. There are North Carolina general statutes that establish power for the Marine Fisheries Commission. The Marine Fisheries Commission delegates authority of oyster resource management to the Division of Marine Fisheries. The Division of Marine Fisheries implements a fisheries management plan that parts specifically handles oyster population and managing its ecosystem services. So when it comes to oyster aquaculture facilities, they are generally affecting the public use of the sounds. And when it comes to public use and public interest, the public trust doctrine must be taken into account. The public trust doctrine labels certain lands and waters for use by the public amongst other protections, including recreational uses. These rec recreational uses include swimming, boating, and fishing. These lands and waters are protected by the state and cannot be privately owned, nor can it be excluded to the discretion of the public. So areas used for oyster aquaculture are generally in the public trust land and waters. And again, these lands are protected by the state and the federal government. The federal government being the Army Corps of Engineers and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA for short. Now these two organizations collaborated on the federal nationwide permit 48, which is a set of criteria for oyster aquaculture facilities. And in, for the permit, there were 20 public interests were considered, uh, including environmental concerns, fish and wildlife. SAV was also included in the decision making. The decision documented indicated SAV as critical habitat. Thus, under a facility, only a half acre of SAV is allowed in an aquaculture facility. Something that is important to note for the Joey Daniels facility, he got his leasing permit before the federal decision document was established. So he luckily was grandfathered in. But if you were to apply for a lease for an aquaculture facility, you are more likely to receive that lease if it is in deeper water without any SAV. And something else to also take into account is that it is a federal document, so it applies throughout the whole nation, but states and district offices can apply this either more narrowly or more broadly. For the Wilmington district office, their, their application is that there can be no SAV present within the site. So the public interests and, and the federal nationwide permit are taken into account in the North Carolina leasing process. The leasing process is what you would assume it to be. You would have to indicate where the site is and you have to pay um, certain a certain amount for uh, processing fees. But there are also prerequisites for the site that I had indicated earlier, such as the you no know, historical SAV presence. And the public interest is taken into account because once your lease is basically sealed, you have to have a notification uh, requirement that is in the local papers that says where it is, and it's up for public comment for up to 30 days. And yes. So that is just one of the challenges within the oyster aquaculture industry. One thing to note is that before a lease or a site can be taken into account, you have to pay a survey. A survey is basically someone going out and looking for SAV, and this costs between $1,000 to $2,000. Other challenges are the leasing complexities. So if you were to apply at a certain time, depending on who is available in the Division of Marine Fisheries and the amount of time and other factors, you may not see, you might not receive notification within a timely manner. The other, one of the other challenges is that there's only one hatchery in North Carolina. A hatchery is a place where oysters are reproduced and you purchase a seedling. It is to, and since there's only one hatchery, the demand from that hatchery is extremely high and there are a lot of back orders. So a lot of oyster people are forced to outsource their seedlings to Virginia. And it's in our understanding that if you were to outsource to Virginia, you are less likely to have preference of getting the seedlings versus Virginian oyster people. So again, looking at the Virginia and North Carolina comparisons, I want to place emphasis on, yeah, on the 2005 value of the oyster uh, industry in Virginia. It was $240,000 for North Carolina. It was $257,000 roughly. And if we look at 2012 for Virginia, it is 9,554,000 and for North Carolina, roughly 595,000. So 
it's, it's something to take note of. So, and we took note of this through looking at other coastal states. So for Virginia, we had noticed that areas are pre-approved for aquaculture, and we think that if North Carolina were to have pre-approved sites, this would reduce the cost of surveys. In Connecticut and Maryland, there's a joint permit application. There's both this meaning that there is a federal and state application as one. In Rhode Island, there are tax exemptions for aquaculture facilities and the equipment that you purchase. And in Louisiana, you are actually able to purchase the estuary and bottom. So to our, our research, we have a few options if North Carolina were to become successful in the oyster industry. We recommend that the application be streamlined, uh, that there be a reduced cost of the survey or pre-approved sites. The kicks, that we kickstart the hatchery industry to reduce outsourcing from Virginia, and there'd be more research on SAV. And what I mean by more research is that there'd be a more holistic approach towards uh, approaching SAV. And what I mean by that is a patch of SAV may be compromised, but the overall benefits of an oyster aquaculture facility might, should be taken into consideration. And now I will pass it off to Charlotte for our final conclusions. Thank you, Jerome. So now that we've presented to you all of this information, you might be wondering why it all matters. And one of the major reasons is because oyster populations in North Carolina have drastically declined. And this is problematic because oysters provide ecosystem services and are a valued food source in the state. Additionally, these small oyster populations mean there is a smaller industry or oyster industry in North Carolina compared to other coastal states like Virginia. Lastly, we found in our social science research that people really highly value eating local oysters and would prefer to eat local oysters. However, with a small industry, it means that many of the oysters being served in North Carolina are from out of state. Now, promoting oyster aquaculture can contribute to a growing oyster industry as well as increasing, increasing oyster populations. However, before policies are implemented to promote this industry, several things should be considered, including the potential economic benefits, the potential effects on ecosystems, both in terms of the ecosystem services it may provide and the effects on SAV. And lastly, the public's perceptions and attitudes should be considered. Um, so in our natural, natural science research, we found that aquaculture may actually improve the quality of ecosystems and improve the conditions for SAV. We found no detrimental impacts on SAV, and we found that through increased water clarity and nutrient regulation, the conditions for SAV growth might actually be improved by oyster aquaculture. If future research confirms these findings, the public seems likely to support the oyster industry. And this is based on the fact that 61% of the, or 62, excuse me, percent of the people studied were willing to make, pay more for environmentally produced food. And of those people that believe oysters are useful for more than just food, they had a higher willingness to pay for oysters. Again, if our findings are confirmed in future research, policies regarding oyster aquaculture within the state may want to be revised to more greatly promote the industry in North Carolina. And we'd like to thank you for your attention, and we'll now open the floor up for questions.